You are welcome here. Whatever your age, your size, the color of your eyes, your hair, your skin, you are welcome here. No matter your gender, whom you love, how you speak or whatever your abilities, you are welcome here. You're welcome here whether you come with laughter in your heart or tears. No matter what you've experienced in the past, no matter what awaits in the future, you are welcome here. Whether you believe in God all of the time, some of the time, or none of the time, you are welcome here. This is a community of open minds, loving hearts and willing hands. You are welcome here at South Valley Unitarian Universalist Society. And good morning. Good morning. I'm Brenda, I'm a member of the board. I've been here at South Valley a long time. I love it when we do outdoor worship. Yay, so glad everyone's here. Um, this is our water ceremony day, and this is a tradition with us and many UU congregations, so it's a special day and it's, it's gonna be great. And we're going to next start our meditation on breathing. and welcome in our hearts. I invite the children to gather around the table while we light our chalice. Wyatt, would you like to help me with that? Chalice is a symbol of our faith tradition lit every weekend. To honor our togetherness, This morning we, write, we light our chalice with the words of Gregory Pelly, who writes, thirsty. And so we gather from the ebb and flow of our lives, thirsty for connection to ourselves, thirsty for connection to others, thirsty for the connection to the larger life. And as we light this chalice, may all who gather here be filled, filled with joy and hope, filled with compassion and love. Here may we be filled so that we may pour ourselves out into the world. Reading. The children may stay up here if you'd like, or you may go back with your parents, whatever is most comfortable for you. We'll be back in just a moment for the story. Your 
Hello, my name is Liz Lampson. I am a musician, writer, and artist. Um, also a friend to John Allen and Ricklin and Reverend Laura and this community. Thank you for having me. Um, I would like to share two poems um, honoring my Korean ancestry. I'm Korean and African-American. Um, and these are two poems um, that relate to the celebration of water. This is called A Clamshell by Yoon Dongju, written in December of 1935. <clears throat> shimmering, shimmering clamshell. My sister found a clamshell on the beach. Here in the north, a clamshell is a precious gift. A clamshell is a toy. Tumbling, tumbling, we're having fun. The other half is lost, and the clamshell misses its mate. Shimmering, shimmering clamshell. It yearns, as I do, for the sound of water, for the sound of the sea. And this next poem uh, I wrote myself for this event. It's called Rice and Water. And for reference, um, in Korean culture, you try not to waste your leftover rice. So one of the things you can do with it is serve it as a snack, kind of like cold cereal, literally like cornflakes and cold milk, but just plain cold rice in cold water. And you just eat it like that. <laughs> rice and water. My Korean mother serves leftover rice in cold water, sometimes with two fancy toppings, American cheese and ham. Cold cereal, salty though, not sweet, like Captain Crunch in the United States. Cooked rice returns to cold water, nostalgic for the flooded terraced fields of its youth. Food from the intentional flood, inches deep to keep weeds and vermin at bay. Not drowning, but engulfing the semi-aquatic plant to birth itself from seed to stalk in the amniotic fluid of irrigation. From flooded field, to harvest, to boiling pot, to warm, soft, sticky dinner, to stale leftover, to cereal bowl, flooded with cold water again, rice comes back to life, grains swimming in my spoon, a new meal. and the land acknowledgement. As we gather this morning, we do so on the ancestral and current homelands of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. We acknowledge the complex and violent history that resulted in the stealing of these lands and the cultural and physical genocide perpetuated against its peoples at the hands and policies of white colonial settlers. We commit ourselves to undoing these harms and we seek to authentically and with honesty engage in the necessary work that will produce justice for those disenfranchised and that promotes healing for the whole of the earth and all its peoples. Thank you. Morning friends. It's time for our story this morning and if you aren't already up here, I'd like to invite all of our young people and the young at heart to join me up here for our story this morning. We have something familiar to some of you that's going to help us tell our story. Some of you may remember this. This is our Wonder Box. And this morning, our Wonder Box is going to help us tell the story of the paper dragon. And in this story, there is a village that is being terrorized by a dragon that has awoken from its 100 year sleep. It is scaring and terrorizing this village and the village gets together and decides that someone needs to go and confront the dragon named Su Jin. And so Mi Fei, one of the villagers who is a young painter is asked to confront the dragon. And so 
Mifei ventures to Su Jin's lair and awakens uh, Su Jin from uh, just a, a short nap that he was taking after being awake for some time from this hundred year slumber and says, Su Jin, my people are suffering in the village. You have to stop this terror. Our fields are burning, our people are scared. And so Su Jin says, okay, but in order for me to go back into my hundred year slumber, I need to put you to the test. This is the way a lot of stories go, isn't it? Some of these heroes' journeys. I need to put you to the test. So Su Jin asks Mi Fei this question. He says, what is the most important thing that your village has created? And so Mi Fei uh, says this, paper. This is the most important thing that my village has created. Paper is used for painting and for writing and for art. And so this is the most important thing. And so Su Jen the dragon laughs, <laughs> paper. Okay, well then, here is your test. You will first go and bring me something. You will bring me fire wrapped in paper. So Mi Fei says, oh my gosh, fire wrapped in paper. How am I going to do that? So he goes back to the village and he opens his scrolls with his paintings and writings. And then he begins to color the paper and cut it and fashion it into one of these. Have you seen one of these before? Do you know what this is? This is a lantern, right? So usually there's a light that will go in here. And so amazingly, Su Jin the dragon is astonished that Mi Fei is able to bring him fire, a little candle wrapped in paper. And so Su Jin says, all right then, the second test is I want you to bring me wind wrapped in paper. Oh my goodness, Mi Fei says, how am I going to do that? Wind wrapped in paper, the fire was hard enough. So Su Jin goes back to his village and he goes back to his scrolls and he begins to fashion and cut and fold the paper. And then he returns to Su Jin's lair with one of these. It's a fan. So Su Jin, astonished, says, All right then. Finally, I ask you this question. What is the thing that your village cherishes the most? And I want you to bring back that thing because I assume that it's probably something very big and very heavy. So I want you to bring back that thing wrapped in paper. <sighs> the strongest thing in the village wrapped in paper. And so Mi Fei goes back to his village and he goes back to his scrolls and he paints and he writes and he's frustrated at first trying to figure out what this thing is. And then suddenly something occurs to him and he suddenly knows exactly what he's going to paint. And so once more, Su Jin returns, or Mi Fei returns to Su Jin's lair, and he unveils a scroll that is painted with all of the members of his village. And he tells Su Jin that the strongest thing in their village is love. And this really seems to change Su Jin the dragon's attitude a little bit. And he can even see a tear. I mean, Fei can see a tear coming down Su Jin's cheek. So love seems to have connected with this dragon. And as Mi Fei is showing the picture that he 
painted of his village to Su Jin, he says this, love can move mountains. Love can stretch the sky, calm the sea. Love brings light and life. Isn't that a wonderful story? There's a couple of things that occur to me in this story. One, it makes me think about how sometimes, at least maybe here in Western culture and others, we may automatically think of things like dragons as being what? What are they like, sometimes we think? Mean, selfish, yeah. But this story makes me think, hmm, I wonder if dragons have the potential to be much more than how we might think of them sometimes. And that word potential, meaning something that has the power to become something else, something better. This paper, the most important thing that Mifei's Village has created, also has a lot of potential. We know that, right? What could this paper become? Isaac. Some sort of card, yes which is also a great way to show love. What else, Wyatt? It could be a message. Yeah, very important. Others? Yeah. It can become a whole bunch of different things. Exactly, so this paper has a lot of potential. So I'll be curious to see. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna leave this paper up on our altar this week and as we come back to church in the coming weeks, I'll be curious to see what this paper might become. Mm. Thank you all for listening to the story this morning. We have a water ritual that we do every year that we're going to be doing in just a little while. And so you are welcome to uh, sit with your families for the rest of our service. It's good to see you all this morning. The River of Community by John Saxon. A religious community is like a river formed from the many streams of our lives that meet and merge and flow to the sea. As members and friends of this religious community, we share our time and energy, our creativity, imagination and vision, our talents, skills and gifts, and the streams of our individual lives to create a river that is both deep and wide. A river that is made of many streams, sustains life and refreshes the land through which it flows. But the river of this community also depends on our shared financial support that makes real this shared value and vision. We will now receive an offering for the support of this religious community and its work in the world. You're invited to give generously and joyfully as you're willing and able. Today's offering will be shared with the Samaritan Fund for South Valley, which provides assistance to members and friends of our community who are in need. Please join me in reading our offering words. They're printed in the order of service. We are this church. We are its hands, its heart, its voice. Together we share the wealth of this community and sustain it with our gifts. And we'll listen to the choir. Humankind, when love and 
that we have been given and all we have found the courage to give. May we be truly grateful. May these gifts be a blessing on the Samaritan fund of this community. Let's extend this time of quiet and calm into a space of prayerful intention followed by silent meditation. This morning, I send my prayer out to the mountains, to the rivers and the streams that flow through this beautiful valley and give thanks for the goodness that is beneath our feet, the goodness that is this time and this place, a time and a place and a gathering of people and intentions that will never again happen exactly so. Let us be reminded of this goodness that is our home, that is our basis, that is our foundation from which we may strive forward to increase that circle of welcome and that time of blessing within the best of our capacity. May the heart of this community made up by so many hearts find itself renewed in this moment. Amen. Let us be silent. Let the sounds seep in and rest. Blessed be.
As we arrive to this day, our annual water ceremony, let us ground ourselves in the season that is unfolding upon us. Here in the Western Hemisphere, we are at the halfway mark between the summer and the winter solstices. Our snowpack has long melted into streams and rivers and flowed over our fields, watering our farms and gardens, sustaining our local flora and fauna. The animal babies from the springtime have grown strong through the summer. The harvests are nearing their completion and our late summer vegetables are giving way to apples and squash, though I still have too many zucchini to do much with. And the much beloved and sometimes hated pumpkin spice latte has made its return to our dry land shores. Even if we still preferred it iced this week, our days are getting shorter and the nights are a bit cooler. And soon we will turn our gardens over to the rest of the winter. The 22nd of September will be the official halfway mark the autumnal equinox. These are the typical signs of the change of the season from summer to fall, and they are the foundation upon which we walk as a community, grounding ourselves in this time and in this place. Alongside these typical signs, there are also signs of a warming planet. Hotter than usual temperatures have extended the drought here into its third year. Our Great Salt Lake has receded beyond its lowest point ever recorded in July to now a new low. The land is dry and our eyes may search the horizon for smoke in fear of those wildfires that we have come to expect and learned to endure. In other places in this land, too much rain falls and flooding is wreaking havoc on the people, on animal and insect and rock and tree and human people, the land struggles to manage an influx of water that has overwhelmed existing infrastructure. Into this context and into this season, we now arrive. Some of us have arrived refreshed and ready and others of us arrive thirsty or in need of renewal. And however we arrive, we do this morning, we do so this morning on purpose, with the intention to join together in community and participate in our annual rite of ingathering, a time remembering what bonds us together and refreshes our intentions for the season yet to come. This morning we will honor the sacredness of water, for it is what sustains life. We also name here in the West that water is increasingly scarce and good stewardship of this precious research resource is essential. The water that flows to us from rain and snow through the mountain streams into our lakes and reservoirs is some of the purest to be found. The peoples of this valley have a long history of advocacy to protect our watersheds. Generations of indigenous tribes and peoples have honored and worshiped and found sacred the waters of this valley. The settlers that arrived here followed in that legacy. Our collective love of this valley, ringed in snow, is a strong foundation for moving now into a deeper relationship with the land of this place. And while it can sometimes be overwhelming to read the news of climate change and of a lake that is receding, I would call us this morning away from that distracted and distressed attention into a firmer and more grounded sense of place, a focus of intentional and faithful presence that reminds us that in fact, we, we are the ones we have been waiting for. There are so many people and so many entities that have been working to address the complex challenges of climate change. 
investment in new technologies and proposals for sustainable city planning, infrastructure development, all these projects and plans and visions are already in motion. We do not need to return again and again to the choice of whether or not we need to respond. We already made that choice as a people. We are already responding. Let us not be distracted by the few remaining naysayers. Let us instead focus on the collective action and how we might support and continue that action to grow. Let us maybe imagine that resolving and addressing and mitigating climate change is like the downfall of water into our streams and rivers. It is inevitable. Perhaps that is a better foundation from which to start our advocacy. It's inevitability of success. This is not to claim that there are no consequences. This is not to state that there is not already suffering happening. And then that suffering is mitigated upon people who have the fewest resources. It is, however, a call to stand in this moment and to see the world as it is and respond with a vision for what can be. The call to see things as they are and not to get mired down in the what ifs and losing time and losing our focus in cycles of hopelessness and despair, which is a reality that can come to our hearts and minds as we face this complex challenge. This is a call to be present first and to allow our presence to be foundational for our action, to root ourselves to this land and this place and these people here this morning as our co-collaborators and our fellow travelers in this journey ahead. To ground ourselves such is to claim a powerful and positive potential. A powerful and positive potential. And to root us in that going forward, I would offer you two metaphors. One Rob began to introduce to you this morning, that of the dragon that breathes fire. In Western mythologies, the dragon lives in the mountains often breathes fire, destroys the land, and needs to be slain. That dragon represents that which must be faced, lest we suffer annihilation in community. And the hero that responds in that mythology responds not because they are necessarily already courageous and strong by nature, but because they are willing to undergo the encounter on behalf of the community. The hero that responds in that mythology embarks on the journey confronting and overcoming adversity, shedding layers of self no longer useful, and is willing to be changed by the encounter. At the end of that story, the community is restored. <laughs> I wish I had a story about quail, because they're obviously listening in this morning as well. Uh, in Eastern mythologies, in Eastern mythologies, the dragon lives in lake bottoms and in rivers. And they are seen as positive, powerful, positive spirits, auspicious, and welcome signs of prosperity rather than of destruction. The Eastern dragon is wise and friendly and beautiful, and they invite people to respond and to transform through reflection by posing powerful questions that illuminate and inspire positive change. Now, it would be easy to suggest this morning that we need to jettison the one for the other as potentially more salvific in the face of climate change, but I would think that would be a disservice to both. I think we need both kinds in order to address the challenge ahead. We need a fire-breathing dragon to alert us to the degradation of the climate that is already upon us. And that indeed, we need powerful, courageous, and uncomfortable action 
in order to confront the forces that would continue our progress towards annihilation. But we cannot all be heroes all the time. We need to remember that heroics are by their nature isolated, singular events, and that waging war perpetually is a recipe for exhaustion. We need more than one story to support us in this time. So we also need the water dragon who dwells in our waters at the bottom of our great salt lake even to catch us in our despairing moments. Remind us that we are far more powerful than we imagine, that we can rise collectively and with faithful attention to the challenges of our time and place. And to remember that the water dragon is far larger than the lakes and rivers that it inhabits, that that river god cannot be contained. And to remember that the Eastern stories tell us that the dragons are the veins of the dragon, are the rivers and streams of our mountains. That it's breath, not of fire, but of water vapor, creates the atmospheric rivers that bring us our rain. And that its ultimate home is the Milky Way that lights our way at night, connecting us to the cosmos in its ever-changing and never-ending cycles. We need both of these narratives to recognize that while the water may be low now, our story is far from over. We need the fire dragon to shift, to focus our attention on actions that are most productive, and we need the water dragon to encourage us. And together we can meld these two into a faithful grounding for this community, a new place where we do not arrive only exhausted and thirsty, but a community that feeds and nurtures, waters and blesses itself for the journey ahead. Let us make real the blessing of these words and of the words and song already shared this morning by beginning our water service. I would like to invite my dear collaborator, Bob, forward to bless and invite the water to begin. We embody truth through the concrete, specific act of joining. That truth is here right underneath our feet. Emily Dickinson expressed it through the voice of a small bird. I was a Phoebe, nothing more. A Phoebe, nothing less. The little note that others dropped, I fitted into place. I dwelt too low that any seek too shy that any blame. A Phoebe makes a little print upon the floors of fame. Just think about the water right here now that we have brought and the journeys it has made and will continue. Small flows begun in cracks in high rock walls rivulets and seepages uniting into streams, streams joining into rivers, lakes, but always moving, always flowing to our great salt lake or to the ocean, waters of the world. But that's not the end. As vapor that combined, combined water rises to unite into huge rivers in the atmosphere, from beside the Philippines in the West Pacific, for example, to flow quickly through the sky, first to the Sierras with big storms, and then to us to fall again into the watersheds we know. In this way, as we 
combine the water we have brought and we reflect on what that precious water means. Our generous intent embraces the whole world. At this time, we are going to invite you to come forward to our altar. We have two bowls this morning. This first bowl, the glass bowl, is where you pour your offering of water that you may have brought. And if you didn't bring water, it doesn't matter. You just come up anyway. And then this bowl um, is the blessing bowl. And this water is the water that was purified from last year's service. And it will offer you a libation on your hands as refreshing to you this morning. So this morning we have water from last year. We have rocks that represent the purification of our mountains. And we have, um, we have water, we have rocks, sorry. And we have two bowls, sorry. Last year's bowl and this year's bowl. Um, and at the end of today's service, I will add the water back into this and part of it will be offered to the tree outside on South Valley's lawn. And then this water will be purified and used for blessings throughout the next year. So come forward at this time as you wish. Would you like to come and stand here with me?
This water is sacred. It is made sacred by the many hands that have poured it with intention and love, the many stories that each drop contains, the many lives surrounding it in this unique moment, connected by commitment and faith. The water is sacred. May it continue to flow through this community with shining reflections of the unique gifts that flow through each of those of us gathered here. I invite you to respond. This water is sacred. Let us continue. May it continue to nurture this community with sustaining hope that we journey together through ripples of growth and change. Please respond. May it continue to bless this community with loving reminders of our collective responsibility to one another and the world. May its ripples be a reminder that the changes and growth within this community bring movement and transformation to the world beyond our pavilion. May its purity offer grace to our community and the willingness to forgive ourselves and one another when we make mistakes. In moments when we are confused or uncertain, may it bring us clarity of purpose and commitment. In moments when the reservoirs of hearts and spirits are drained by sorrow or pain, may it nourish them with the knowledge that we are surrounded by a deep and abundant love. This water is. And so it is, and so we are. Blessed be the whole of creation, and amen. Okay, that's awesome. <laughs> Let us now take a moment to extinguish our chalice and receive the following benediction. Water, D.H. Lawrence wrote, water is H2O, hydrogen two parts and oxygen one. 
But there is a third thing that makes it water, and no one knows what it is. Let us extinguish our chalice and enjoy a final musical interlude with our choir this morning. Say with me our words of extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this chalice, but not the warmth of love, the light of truth, or the energy of action. Some combination of the beginning and opening that was. That was fine, though. We love each other in our hearts until we meet again. <laughs>